morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the conference today. Wonderful to see so many people. And um, my first task is to introduce Auntie Laurel Robinson, who's going to um, do a special acknowledgement for us. Over to you, Auntie Laurel. The slam and I sing for... Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the sixth annual Nauru Wanyara Aboriginal Health Conference. My name is Auntie Laurel Robinson. I'm Yori Yori woman of the Alapna clan through my mother, and I am also of the Yarra clan of the Wurundjeri tribe through my father. I acknowledge all the ancestors and elders across the country. I am one of 13 children born to my parents, Selwyn and Geraldine Briggs. I spent my childhood growing up between Kamraganja on the Dungala River and Shepparton. We were living in the tin huts on orchards like many of our people at that time. This resulted in poor health for many of the children. My parents were always involved, always with other elders, Uncle Sir Douglas Nichols, Auntie Margaret Tucker and Uncle Jack Patton to name a few. They made changes for our people. My maternal grandmother was a midwife and delivered many babies on Kamraganja. My grandmother and my mother used old medicine remedies on us kids when we were sick. Now when I look back on it, I feel very privileged we were to have that knowledge handed down to us. I have worked close to 40 years in Aboriginal health with, my, with the Aboriginal Medical Services in Redfern, New South Wales. Some of my family were involved in the find, founding of the Aboriginal Health Service in Fitzroy, Victoria in the early 70s, along with other prominent Aboriginal people. They all wanted to make change. It's wonderful today to see so many Aboriginal people involved in all aspects of medical and health. For closing, I wish everyone success in their journey. Yakarmanda Wuta, respects to you all. For the black, for the people of this land. Yama, my name is Rakita Smallwood. I'm a proud Gamilaroi woman from Tamworth. Um, I'd like to pay respects to elders past, present and future and acknowledge traditional custodians of this great Gamilaroi land that you can see here in my background. Thank you. Hello and welcome. My name is Zoe Williams. I am a proud Darubaru Barunga woman from the Western Sydney area. Today, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which I am on, the Rwandri people of the Kula Nation. Opakaka. Welcome, my name is Leah Lindria Morrison. I'm a Yorta Yorta woman, the river people. I would like to also acknowledge the country I am on today, the Ghana people from South Australia. Good afternoon. I acknowledge country, elders, and custodians of land and country. Where I am on Ngunnawal Nambri and where you join from. I pay respects to elders and express thanks for deep spiritual connections with country that have been nurtured so that they can sustain us. To brothers, sisters, aunts and uncles and First Peoples online today, I acknowledge you. And to non-First Peoples committed to the journey of healing in country, in talk and in action, I acknowledge you here on this day also. Hi, this is Gwenda from Yorta Yorta country, that's my background, and I'm speaking to you from the lovely Jajarung country, um, river out the back. My name is Bo Rambledini. I'm a proud Bunjalung elder from Grafton in northern New South Wales. I would like to acknowledge and honour my elders who laid the foundations for a less challenging pathway for me and my mob. I would like to pay uh, my respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the sacred land that I live and work on, the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation. Yuala Naya Rayleigh Naya Gungri, Yulu Dana Naya Dandigu Yori Yora, Yambina Naya Mandana Yelena Dandi, Yambina Naya Wanjuran Mamigan Macha. I said hello, I am Raylene, I am Gungri, 
Today I stand on Yorta Yorta land. I know and respect the people of this land. I know and respect the elders of a long time ago. Thank you. Good morning all. My name is Sean Taylor. I am from the Dawarib tribe, one of the eight tribes of Murray Island in the eastern part of the Torres Strait. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional landowners on the lands I'm gathered here um, this morning on the lands of the Larrakia people. I want to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Minyan Yura Wobolin. Yura Yigu Marala Baragu. Yi Wichibu Waibu Barai. Katai Niran. Hey you mob, I'm David Edwards. I'm a Waramai fella. I work for eMental Health in Practice based at the University of Sydney in Lismore, New South Wales. Hello, welcome. I'm Stephanie King and I belong to the Wangagawa people of Northwest Queensland. And today I acknowledge the Kalkadun people on whose land I'm on. Hi there, my name is Heather McCormack and I'm a Wiradjuri woman with family ties to the central west of New South Wales. I'm currently on beautiful Bidjigal country where I live and work. I acknowledge and pay respects to elders and members of other nations here today. Mandangu, thank you. Thanks so much, um, Aniwa Robinson. And thank you also to the, all the presenters who are going to be um, doing their thing today. I think it's going to be a fantastic day and you'll really enjoy it. I'd like to introduce Councillor Greg James from the Greater Shepparton City Council. Um, Greg is a proud Yorta Yorta man. He's the current chairperson of Rumbalara Aboriginal Corporation. Um, born in Maroopna and lived in Goulburn Valley most of his life. Greg was elected as a councillor in 2020, last year, the first Indigenous person on the Shepparton Council. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Gwenda, for the introduction. I also acknowledge and thank Auntie Laurel for her acknowledgement to country. I acknowledge our elders, both past, present and emerging, and I pay my respects to our ancestors and I acknowledge Yorta Yorta Nations and all its people. I welcome you all online here today for the sixth annual Nawu Wanyara Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Conference. I am currently a councillor at Greater Shepparton City Council, a very proud Yorta Yorta man and chairperson of Rumbalara Aboriginal Cooperative. Our cooperative has presented at this conference in previous years. It is a pleasure to be welcoming you all on behalf of Greater Shepparton City Council. The University of Melbourne Department of Rural Health have held this fantastic conference in Shepparton for a number of years. It is unfortunate that it cannot go ahead in person this year due to the current restrictions. However, we are delighted to be welcoming you virtually. We hope that the conference can be held in our fantastic region again in the near future and that you all can visit and experience the unique lifestyle and charm that our regional town has to offer. This conference is a great opportunity to share information and connect with people committed to reforming and practice and research of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. To celebrate Aboriginal knowledge, systems and strength-based approaches to improving health outcomes of Aboriginal communities. Here, our council is striving to be more culturally safe and sensitive workplace. We have incorporated several health and wellbeing matters into our 2021 and 25 council plan. Our regional aquatic facility, Aquamoves, and our Get Moving and Activities in the Park program are just some examples of the way we are striving for a more happy and healthy region. I look forward to listening to keynote speakers, Mr. Stan Grant, 
Professor Lisa Burke and other respected speakers here today. Finally, can I thank the University of Melbourne for making this event possible and thank you all for joining in today and enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thanks so much, Councillor Greg Jones. I really appreciate that, Malcolm. I would now like to introduce Professor Lisa Burke. Oh, Lisa is um, from the Department of Rural Health, and here she is. I am so delighted to welcome you all to the 2021 Nagar Wuwanyara Conference hosted by the Department of Rural Health at the University of Melbourne. Thank you so much to Auntie Laura Robinson for her delightful acknowledgement of country and to everyone else who acknowledged their traditional countries. I am also on Yorta Yorta country and I pay my respects to the Yorta Yorta people as the traditional owners of this land. I acknowledge elders past and present, as well as all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us this morning. Further, I'd like to thank Greg James um, for his lovely welcome and support of this conference. We have many distinguished guests among us this morning. I'd like to thank Professor Marcia Langton and Professor Sean Ewan in particular for joining us. And also Professor Duncan Maskell. For those of you not from our university, he's the Vice Chancellor of the University of Melbourne and he has a very strong commitment to empowering Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. I acknowledge many others in the audience who are elders and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health practitioners working tirelessly to improve Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and wellbeing. And we have with us a range of community advocates, the directors of POSH at both Sydney and Melbourne, the CEO of the Red Cross in Queensland, and many other senior government academics and health professionals right across Australia. The University of Melbourne welcomes you all to our sixth Nagawu Onyara conference. We've adapted this year to be online, but we're keen to continue our annual conference. Nagawu and Yara means listen, act. This conference is about changing how we talk and understand Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. Words have power and we can change the words that we speak and listen to. For too long, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health has been negative, stigmatizing and blaming. We offer a different talk here. This conference gives voice to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health professionals to share their work. It demonstrates self-determination, Indigenous health in Indigenous hands, if you will. After colonisation, dispossession and repeated traumatic policies, it is time non-Indigenous people undertake their responsibility to empower Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities, to set aside our white privilege and invite support and encourage First Nation Australians to lead the way in health and wellbeing. The many fantastic presentations given here today will make clear that First Nations people are doing just this. We want this to be a safe space today to share Indigenous knowledges and learn about, from, learn from Indigenous scholars and practitioners. Here at the Department of Rural Health, we've got a range of educational courses that bring the University of Melbourne to Shepparton and other rural and remote areas across Australia. This encourages Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to live, work and study on their own traditional countries while completing our courses. First, we have our specialist certificate, which is a two subject uh, postgraduate course from the University of Melbourne uh, that students can enter based on work experience rather than an undergraduate degree. Here students learn about Western knowledges as well as traditional approaches to health. They learn academic skills um, and they develop a lot of confidence so that students, in their words, have a seat at the table. The course is a pathway through to a graduate certificate, a Master of Public Health and possibly a PhD or into many other university courses, depending on their choice. This December, we look forward to a graduation that will celebrate the achievements of 14 students who have completed one of these courses this year or last year. We have seven students graduating from our specialist certificate 
we have our first student graduating from our graduate certificate. So Jane White from remote Queensland will be the first. We have two students graduating from the Master of Public Health and we have four students who've completed their doctorate. These are amazing accomplishments. And behind every, every student is a strong and proud First Nations person who's studied hard and they've dug deep to juggle family, work, community with the demands of study. They are role models, leaders, and the future of Aboriginal prosperity. We also work with the Academy of Sports, Health and Education here in Shepparton to support our First Nations students through nursing qualifications. Um, all the students in this program have found work and they too are role models and are changing the cultural safety of our local health services. So if you want to hear more about these students and our programs, I encourage you to join concurrent session one this afternoon, which showcases many of the projects undertaken by these students, and it's the students presenting. But throughout the day, the choice of which session to attend um, will be difficult because there are so many wonderful uh, research projects, uh, health programs and initiatives um, spoken about in, in the presentations today. We also have with us Zoe Williams. Zoe is a First Nations medical student at the University of Melbourne, and she too is our future. As part of her studies, Zoe is undertaking a research project that aims to engage First Nations communities about their perspectives, knowledges, and understandings of health and ways of being that is imperative to developing a culturally safe workforce. At lunchtime, Zoe invites First Nations people from across rural Victoria um, to attend a focus group to share their perspectives of on, on country learning. The data collected um, will be shared back with the communities and will also uh, inform an on country learning program for medical stu students that will be piloted next year. So, we all want Zoe to do well. So, we encourage you to to join that at lunchtime. We also have some art activities at lunchtime for those who have registered, and you'll hear about some other cultural activities through the day, including songs from Lily Walker, a remarkable young singer from Shepparton. So thank you for coming, enjoy the conference, and again, on behalf of the University of Melbourne, welcome. Oh, thanks so much, Lisa. Um, really appreciate that. I'm sure we've all enjoyed being welcomed. Um, I'm now got the privilege of introducing our next speaker, um, Mr. Stan Grant, who no doubt you have all heard of, um, is an Australian political journalist and television presenter. Born in Griffiths in New South Wales in 1963, Stan's mother is from the Camilleroy people and his father were a three. Um, Stan spent most of his childhood on the road, living in small towns and Aboriginal communities across our New South Wales. His father was an itinerant sawmiller who worked when and where he could. Stan has hosted major news and current affairs programs on Australian commercial and public TV. He has been a political correspondent to the ABC, a Europe co correspondent to the Seven Network based in London, and a senior international correspondent to the international broadcaster CNN based in Hong Kong and Beijing. Stan is passionate about justice and humanity. His years of international reporting have given him a deep understanding of how the world works. He is deeply immersed in the politics and history of Asia and the Middle East. Lives in Sydney, married to ABC sports broadcaster Tracy Holmes, and they have four children. And Stan, it's just an absolute delight to um, hand over to you. Thank you for coming. I hope everyone can see me. Um, can see me now. Thank you so much for that um, 
that really wonderful introduction there, Gwenda. Um, and it's an absolute pleasure to be with you all here today as well. Um, as unworthy as I am, if I look at the incredible achievements of the people who are graduating today and the work that all of you do, um, the vital work that you do in health. I'm, I'm not a health worker. Um, I'm a mere journalist and, and storyteller. Um, and I'm absolutely awed to be, um, to be in your presence today and be able to, to share this moment with you. I want to pay respects to the Gadigal and Vigil people on whose land I'm joining you today. Um, respects to my own ancestry as well, Wiradjuri, Gamaroy and Darawal, uh, and to also pay respects to the people on whose land that you're joining us today as well. Um, it's, it's fitting that we're talking about health and that we're acknowledging the incredible achievements of people who are graduating today, um, because it's with some sadness that I join you today. Um, I learned yesterday that my uncle, my father's younger brother, had passed away. Um, it was something that sadly we were expecting, but when these things happen, as we all know in our families, um, they hit us hard. And I wanted to be able to remember him today, uh, remember his contribution to our people, someone who gave his life to working among our people back on our country, Baradjuri country, and also in Canberra, where he worked at the Department of Aboriginal Affairs, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, Aboriginal hostels, and a whole range of different Indigenous organisations. My uncle was a connection to something very deep and very profound for me, a connection to history and to country and to a sense of belonging and being in the world. If you look at the span of his 74, 75 years uh, of life, he went from living on the fringe camps, on the margins of society, um, to working in Canberra, to making a real contribution to the lives of our people and never losing that deep sense of connection to who we are. And for me, he was not just an uncle. He was, as we know in our own culture, our uncles are also our fathers. And, um, and I feel he's lost today as I would for my father. So I'm remembering him today and be proud to be able to be here um, and to, to represent him and to represent my family and to talk to all of you. It is an improbable journey, isn't it? Uh, when you consider the achievements of people who are graduating today. When I was a boy, the thought of going to university was utterly unthinkable. Um, my life, as you heard in the introduction, was spent on the road, traveling from town to town, mum and dad, looking for work wherever we could find it. My education was sporadic at best, just like so many of our people. I probably stopped and started at least 13 or 14 schools before I was even into high school. There were periods of weeks, sometimes months, where I barely went to school at all. And like so many of our people as well, constantly with the threat and the fear of being removed. I remember clearly welfare officers coming to the school and calling the Aboriginal kids out, um, inspecting our hair and our ears, looking at our lunch boxes, asking questions about our families and living with absolute fear whenever I saw a white car parked in the street thinking it could have been the welfare. It was part of the reason I think that mum and dad lived the life that they did, an itinerant life, a restless life, a life constantly on the move, a life staying one step ahead of authorities. Both my parents had experienced the pain of seeing loved ones in their own family uh, taken away as well. It meant that by the time I finished high school, um, I'd probably been to 17 or 18 different schools. University, as I said, was something that was just simply not on the cards at all. My first job out of school was working for the Institute of Aboriginal Studies in Canberra um, when I, again, just these incredible twists of fate um, to be born into a period when there was so much activism and energy coming from our people busting down doors, the 67 referendum, the establishment of the Aboriginal Affairs Department, the tent embassy, the burgeoning protest movement, the beginning of the health services and legal services, that extraordinary um, flourishing of leadership and power and uh, speaking back to a country that had not listened to us. And I was fortunate when I was at the Institute of Aboriginal Studies working as the mail boy, delivering mail in the morning and photocopying in the afternoon to come into contact with someone who's joining us here today, uh, Professor Marcia Langton, who um, was then studying at the, at the Australian National University and pulled me aside in the 
in the Institute Library one day and gave me the um, clip up the ears that I needed and told that I need to do something with my life to honour the, the sacrifice and the hard work of my parents and my ancestors, that there was an opportunity for me to go to university and I should seize that um, through Marcia's assistance and help university became a reality for me. But I remember clearly going from Canberra to, to Sydney and, and attending the University of New South Wales where um, there were just a handful of us. Uh, the Aboriginal students there could all gather around one dinner table and we frequently, we frequently did. Uh, and living in an environment and entering an environment that was so foreign to me um, and, and hostile in reality people who had no experience with Aboriginal people, um, no way of me connecting with them nor them connecting with me. Uh, I remember clearly being afraid to enter the dining hall um, to, at, at, at mealtimes at the college that I, that I, I lived in um, because I just simply didn't know how to, how to connect with these people or how to, to live alongside these people. To see today the incredible success of our people graduating university in increasing numbers um, and postgraduate study as we're seeing here today is an indication of how far we have come and gives us hope for how far we can go into the future. So I want to pay absolute respect to everybody for all that you've achieved today. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you probably for about 25 minutes, half an hour, and then take some questions. And I really invite you to send any of your questions through I find the questions more interesting than what I have to talk about, to be honest. But I wanted to share with you some of my thoughts and experiences of having traveled the world, uh, having been a reporter, having lived in five different countries, having reported from more than 70 or 80 countries, having spent 20 years of my life outside of Australia, looking back at Australia, thinking constantly about our country, our history, my place in the world our people's place in the world, measuring Australia by the countries that I lived and worked on, reflecting on where our country fails and where our country succeeds. But I wanted to talk to you about the idea and, and the one profound idea that I've taken away from all of my travels, my experience as a boy, the culture and the, the pride that I was uh, in my own heritage that I was raised in, and that is the idea of impermanence, not of certainty, not of the idea that we can solve the world's problems or that we have the answers to the world's problems or that the answers are simple, but impermanence and complexity and contradiction. These are the things that I've seen as I've traveled the world, the people that I've read, the authors and the poets and the historians and the philosophers who try to explore that gray zone between black and white, between faith, between nations, between cultures, between religions and languages, and how we share this tiny planet. And it is such a small planet, um, a big population relatively in such a small place. How we share this place with respect and dignity, with respect for each other and the dignity to live fulfilling lives. And that idea of permanence, of change, of being ever open to change has been the one constant. I'm reminded now that you're graduating during a period of enormous upheaval. The world is going through something that we have not experienced since the end of the First World War and the onset of what became known as the Spanish flu, which ultimately killed more people than World War I itself. I was looking at photographs just the other day of that time and seeing people standing on the streets wearing masks, societies having to endure lockdown, all of the things that we're experiencing now and being reminded of the fragility of our planet. Coronavirus has accelerated change and it has revealed the cracks in our society. It's been said that a pandemic is not a health crisis. It is a societal phenomenon, a social phenomenon with a health aspect. And when you look at the impact of coronavirus, so many of us who have never had coronavirus or never will or don't know anyone who has had it, has been touched by the impact 
of the pandemic, whether it has been shut down, locked away from loved ones, unable to attend weddings and funerals, separated from parents and children, locked away from our schools and universities, studying online, meeting as we are today um, on the internet. It has affected all of our lives. There is an economic aspect to this as well. We know that our economies have plunged into recession, indeed into depression in parts of the world. But of course, coronavirus has only revealed the strains that were already there. It has revealed the depths of inequality in our societies that is tearing apart our societies. The people who have been impacted by coronavirus the most, no matter where you go in the world, are the poor and the marginalised. Uh, it impacts people along racial lines. In the United States, which has been one of the countries most devastated by coronavirus, it has been African Americans and Native Americans who have borne the brunt of the illness. Here as well, as we did such an extraordinary job in keeping coronavirus initially out of our communities. We've seen that the Delta strain has caught up with us as well and that indigenous communities have been affected here in New South Wales. We've had deaths among our community and it's revealed as well that when it comes to things like vaccination, um, that we have sadly been in some ways an afterthought, that despite being one of the priority groups, we still see today that our communities lag the rest of the population. And while we are in a rush to reopen again, and I'm as much in a rush as anyone else to reopen and get back to our lives, we're also remembering that while our societies and our cities may hit 70 or 80% of people over 16 fully vaccinated, there are still vulnerable sectors of our community, including First Nations people, who are nowhere near that level yet. And when we start to move around our communities again, we're back at the sporting events and we're back at the music events and we're back at the pub and the restaurants and the cinemas, and we're traveling throughout the state. There are some people who still can be devastated by the impact of coronavirus who are nowhere near the levels of vaccination yet. When you talk about a return to normal, you think about our people and what normal would look like. Coronavirus, of course, is just one of so many illnesses the First Nations people are dealing with. It is just another of so many chronic diseases that people are having to manage. Um, we know that we still die 10 years younger than the rest of the population. I don't have to tell anyone else here about the, the, the closing the gap statistics, the socioeconomic measurements that reveal that we are still the most impoverished and the most imprisoned people in the country. Coronavirus has revealed the inequalities in our society. In the United States, a country that I've reported extensively from, we've seen how deep inequality has shaken that society. In the United States, to be a member of the top 1% of the population is to have wealth 900 times greater, 900 times greater than a member of the bottom 50% of the American population. That sort of inequality has torn at the fabric of that society. It was part of the populist wave that led to the election of Donald Trump, who said to people, you have been ignored. People have not listened to you. I'm going to drain the swamp. I'm going to make America great again. The dangers of simplistic messages, simple answers to complex questions that was so alluring to so many people who felt as if Washington, the American political class had stopped listening to them. These are the people who saw the impact of the global financial crisis, who saw the banks bailed out, bankers keeping their jobs, bankers returning to their enormous bonuses while people saw their factories shut down, their jobs lost. It hardened attitudes, it's hardened hearts. It revealed again issues of deep racism in the United States where the political class divided along racial lines. Overwhelmingly, it was the white disenfranchised, disenchanted, who voted for Donald Trump and put Donald Trump into the White House. Even when Donald Trump spectacularly failed at managing coronavirus, when we saw the United States laid low with numbers barely seen in other countries, Donald Trump still got 70 million votes at the last 
presidential election. More votes than any other sitting president in US history. It was just that Joe Biden got more. No other sitting president had received as many votes as Donald Trump. And of course, we saw the ransacking of the Capitol building, the so-called heart of democracy in the United States, again revealing the deep fractures in that society. What else did we see throughout coronavirus? We saw the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. No coincidence, coincidence that a group of people who had been left out, who had been marginalized, who were still the poorest in the United States, who were seeing their people dying in the streets at the boots and the knees of police officers, would take to the streets in the middle of a pandemic to challenge that society, to say to the United States, if you truly are a beacon of democracy, if you truly are the shining city on the hill, then how do you account for the failure to deal with the legacy of race and the impact of racism still in that society? Coronavirus has revealed these deep fractures. It's revealed the, the fault line between democracy and autocracy. I've reported from some of the most repressive regimes on earth. I've reported the wars of Iraq and Afghanistan. I've seen the devastating impact of conflict. I've stood in the bloodied marketplaces, bombed out marketplaces after terrorist bombings, where the blood is so thick on the ground you can smell it. You can taste it in the back of your mouth that sticks to the soles of your shoes, where parents dig the burning flesh out of the pockmarked holes in the walls and put them into plastic bags because it is all they have left to bury of their children. I've seen what we can do to each other. I've travelled into North Korea, a country known as the Hermit Kingdom, sealed off from the rest of the world, a, a country still living in a state of war, a country that has armed itself with nuclear weapons while its own people have perished in famine, died of starvation. I spent a decade reporting on and living in China, seeing this extraordinary country, the rise of a remarkable country that has lifted 700 million people out of poverty, that has gone from being what was described as the sick man of Asia into being what is now on the cusp of being the most powerful economy in the world, overtaking the United States, and yet a country where we couldn't have these conversations today, a country where you don't vote, a country where you don't get to express your opinion, a country that has been accused of committing a modern genocide against the Uyghur people who were locked up in what's been described as brainwashing camps, whose children, and we remember in our own country, whose children have been taken away destruction of language, destruction of culture, a country that is our biggest trading partner, but a country that in no way shares the commitment to human rights that we see in other parts of the world. The rise of China is upending our world, it's changing our world. It's no coincidence that an illness that emerged out of Wuhan has shaken the world at the same time that China's rise is shaking the world. We hear our Politicians talk so much more about war today. We've increased our defence budget. We have crossed the nuclear threshold where we have done a deal with the United States and the UK to develop nuclear-powered submarines. China has said directly to us that that now makes Australia a target. China talks about an invasion of, of Taiwan to reunify Taiwan with the mainland, a, potentially a war that could escalate to involve the United States and, of course, us in Australia as well. These are incredibly volatile times, times that are uncertain, times where there are not simple answers to complex questions. At the same time as we've seen a rise of autocracy and authoritarianism in our world, we've seen a retreat of democracy. Freedom House, which is an organisation which measures the strength of democracy, in our world now counts 15 straight years of declining freedom, declining democracy. There are fewer democratic states today than there were last year, the year before that, the year before that, a decade before that. Democracy is in retreat as autocracy is on the rise. Our world is going through 
an upheaval not seen since the lead up to World War I. I think about this a lot and I think about the places that I've reported from and I, I place today's history over the history of the past. Of course, in the lead up to World War I, it was said that the war, the war could not happen. War would be impossible. Germany and the UK were each other's biggest trading partners. The Kaiser and the King were cousins. And of course, the world drifted to war. After World War I, there was the Spanish flu. Then there was the Great Depression, the rise of fascism, the lead up to World War II. If you look at our world today, what have we seen over the past two decades? We've seen terrorist attacks of 9-11 on the United States that triggered the unending wars of Afghanistan and Iraq, upheaval across the Middle East, countries turned upside down, rulers overthrown, civil war breaking out. We saw the global financial crisis, which as I've said before, upended politics in the United States, tipped the world into a depression. We've seen the rise of China as we saw the rise of Germany during the, the lead up to First World War and then again during the lead up to the Second World War. And of course, we've seen the impact of coronavirus. Mark Twain once said, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. And we're seeing history rhyming today. So many of the things that we've seen it's happening in our world today, we've seen in the past. And sadly, we know where that leads. What does this mean for us? What does this mean for First Nations people? We don't live in a world apart. What happens globally affects us. Of course, we are a product of the rise of what is seen as modernity, the arrival of the British, the invasion, the dispossession, the massacres, the segregation, the exclusion, the stolen generations. All of these things were part of our entry into what is seen as a modern world. We cannot divorce ourselves from what is happening in our world today. And when it comes to these questions of history and identity and race, we know that they land hard on us. I wanted to talk to you about three things that I think have been at the forefront of my mind as I've traveled the world and reported the world. Three things that continue to shape our world today. And then to look at potentially how we navigate these three fault lines. One is the fault line of race. Race is not real. Race is a scientific fiction. There is nothing that separates us as races. We belong to a human race. And yet we know that race has been used to divide our world. Race has been used as a pretext for colonization and invasion and empire. Can we escape race and racism? Are we marked at birth, stamped in a world where race will forever define us? Like so many of you here, I have those childhood memories of when I first became aware of racism, when I first became aware that the color of my skin marked me as something different. I remember the day as if it was yesterday, sitting in a class when I was about six years old and a young white boy sitting next to me, putting his arm next to mine and saying, why is your skin so black? It never occurred to the boy to ask himself, why is his skin so white? The world was white. The teacher was white. The other students were white. The people on television were white. The political leaders were white. The singers and actors and performers and artists and novelists and the, were white. The people who worked in the local shops were white. Why would he question his place in the world? And yet, at that young age, I had to confront my place in the world. As Franz Fanon, the, uh, the philosopher and psychiatrist, once said, look, a Negro, as if you were something different, as if you were something apart, someone who has to explain themselves to the world. Race wraps us in its twisted logic at such a young age. I remember going home that afternoon with a friend of mine, another Aboriginal boy who was in the class with me, whose parents, it was, he was the adopted son of the local Presbyterian minister and his wife, and we went home and he told his mother what had happened and she looked at us with great kindness and said, 
but you're not black. You have lovely olive skin. And I think about that today, and I think how in one day I was asked, why is your skin so black? And in the same day told, no, you're not black. You have lovely olive skin, as if that somehow made it better, as if that was somehow more palatable. But the overwhelming lesson was, you are not white. Race and racism continues to hold us in its grip today, to even begin to think in terms that we, we don't even use the word race is maddening. It's almost impossible. A few years ago, I read a fantastic book by two African-American scholars, Barbara and Karen Fields, sisters, one an historian, one a sociologist. And they coined the term race craft, race craft. They believe that race and racism is like witchcraft. Our power, the power that we give it, is the power to believe. Once we are locked in the logic of race and racism, once we are locked in that language, we can never escape. It holds us in its perverse logic. As they say, when someone says someone is segregated because of their race, they're not segregated because of their race. Their race has nothing to do with it. They are segregated because someone has made a decision based on what this person's race is meant to be. That political decisions are made around race. Racism is like witchcraft. Its power comes from our power to believe. I wanted to talk to you about history and the, the hold that history has on us. As someone who was brought up in Australia with the stories of my people, the stories that I got from my mother and my father, looking at the, the scars on the body of my own people who had born, carried the wounds of Australia. History was unavoidable. History was inescapable. And yet I know what it is like to carry the weight of history, how history can devour us, how history can torture us, how history can be the poison in the blood that slowly kills us. There was a, a famous painting I once saw. It was the painting of an angel. The angel's wings were open and its head was pointed backwards. It was a painting known as the Angelus Novus, the angel of history. The painting was bought by the German Jewish philosopher, Walter Benjamin in a Munich market, and he became fixated, obsessed on it. He hung it in every single apartment building that he ever lived in. And he wrote this about the Angelus Novus. He says, it shows an angel looking as though he is about to move away from something. He is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned toward the past, where we perceive a chain of events. He sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. How history is an unending catastrophe. Walter Benjamin ultimately fled Germany and he went to Paris. And after being after the, the invasion of the Nazis and Germany conquering France, he took his own life, someone who could not escape the catastrophe of history. I'm reminded of something that the French philosopher Jacques Derrida once said. He spoke of people who have the bread of apocalypse in their mouths. He said, these are the people formed by history, haunted by history. History, he says, is a ghost returning over and over. Derrida asked, what does it mean to follow a ghost? We are persecuted, he said, by the very chase we are leading. The future comes back in advance, from the past, from the back. The places that I've reported on, the stories that I've reported, have been the places where history hangs heavily. The years that I spent in China, a country that still lives with the hundred years of humiliation colonization and empire, the impact of the opium wars with Britain in the middle of the 
19th century, the collapse of the Qing Empire, which triggered revolution and rebellion and warfare on an unimaginable scale. Of the five bloodiest conflicts in human history, three of them took place in China itself. That China is a place where history haunts them. In Russia, where I reported from, where history is measured in blood, the memory of massacre, of war, of revolution, of unending rebellion. Throughout the Middle East, throughout Europe, the conflicts that people against each other, these unending historical conflicts where there has been no justice, where the angel of history still has its wings outstretched and its eyes turned to the past. The other thing I wanted to talk about was identity and the role that identity plays in our world. Identity, of course, can be the beginning and the end of everything. When we identify ourselves, we're often making a statement of who we are, but we are also often making a statement of who we are not. And I ponder my own identity in the world, my identity as a Rajari Gamaroy Dharawal person, my identity as an Australian, whatever that may mean, an Australia that was never designed for us, my identity as a human being. And I know that I cannot be put into easy boxes. Whenever we tick the box, are you Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? I think of my grandmother, a white Australian woman who married an Aboriginal man, who had Aboriginal children, who was turned away from a hospital having her first child because she was carrying the child of a black person, who would constantly be harassed by the police, accused of running grog to the blacks camp, who was broken mentally and physically by the rejection that she felt in her own country and wonder about identifying myself apart from her. She is surely a part of me as anyone. Identity tries to put us into boxes, tries to give us simple solutions where there are none. We know from our own societies, our own communities, that we don't exclude anyone. There are white people who have married into our families who are part of our communities. My uncle who passed away just yesterday leaves behind my aunt, a beautiful white Australian woman who crossed that line and lived with us and she is a part of us. I don't want to exclude anyone from my identity. And yet when I look around the world, I see that identity at its worst, at its most toxic, is the thing that tears us apart. The conflicts that I've reported throughout the world have been conflicts of identity. Hutu versus Tutsi in Rwanda, Shia versus Sunni, Israeli versus Palestinian, Hindu versus Muslim, the existential nuclear powered conflict between Pakistan and India, North Korea versus South Korea, China and Japan, China and the West, these conflicts where history meets identity can often set fire to our world. The Indian philosopher and economist Amartya Sen once said that solitarist identities, identities that reduce us to one essential thing, kill and kill with abandon. I've seen far too much death in my life. I've covered far too many wars and conflicts in my world to know that identity at its worst can indeed tear us apart. So when we think about our world and we think about the changes in our world today, we think about this moment of history and I think about the enormous responsibility that each of you carry as you graduate and you go into this world of incredible uncertainty. I would say think about the idea of impermanence. Think in ways beyond certainty. Think in ways that are complex and contradictory. Don't look for the simple solutions. Don't look for the simple answers. To look to the things that bind us, that connect us, and to try to 
bring justice to those things that still divide us. I think of my own life and I think of the people that I grew up with, the family that I grew up with, the culture and the community that I was raised in. And I think of how when I stood in refugee camps in Afghanistan, Pakistan or Iraq, and I looked into the eyes of those people who have lost everything, and I see the eyes of my own people. And yet I see incredible dignity and incredible courage, that ability to open yourself to the world, to not be the angel of history, to not have your eyes fixed on catastrophe, to not harden your heart against other people, but to look for ways of bringing people together. There is a way of living beyond certainty, beyond hate, but it must come with a commitment to justice. I think about my uncle today, his struggle, his commitment to making lives better for our people. I think about my father and the work that he's done in keeping Wiradjuri language alive, writing the Wiradjuri dictionary, teaching a new generation to speak our language, black and white. I think about my mother and the stories that she told me as a boy and the poems that she wrote and the short stories that she wrote. And that they gave me the world. I think about Marcia Langton who tapped me on the shoulder in the library when I was 17 years old and told me to do something with my life. These people gave me the world. And this world has led me here to talk to you and to, to see you graduate and to move out into the world today, to continue that fight for justice, to struggle for justice, to struggle for rights, to see that we don't forget our history in our own country, but that our history need not poison us either, to know that our identities are strong, but to know that our identities are not all we are and they are not exclusive, and to know that race and racism has no place in our world. Thank you so much for being able to share this time with you. Um, we have some time for questions now, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you, and hopefully I can bring some sort of uh, reasonable answers to the questions that you're going to ask. In, our, in my language, Mandanguru. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stan, on behalf of all of us. Um, that was very thought-provoking. <laughs> Um, and it actually preempts a couple of the questions that were mm. put in too. So I did. I did see those questions, so I thought <laughs> I might try to speak to that. Yeah, um, and you know we're sort of moving into very profound areas, I think. Um, so one of the questions, which um, if we um, perhaps move from the the racism or or continue on from the the racism angle. Um, somebody asked about uh, institutional racism and, you know, the effect it's having just sort of through education and health and so on, um, continuing to oppress, the, as I, they mentioned. Um, and it's really, there's no easy way or, or it's hard to imagine how we're going to dismantle that. So where can we start and from a non-Indigenous perspective, how can non-Indigenous people be responsible allies? Can, can I just go um, to, to something that, that we heard from Lisa right at the start? It just struck me the moment that she said it because it, it so preempted what I wanted to say today. Words have power. How we change the way we speak. That's critical. Words have power. The moment that we were named Aboriginal people, that had power. It had power over us. It gave someone power over us. There were no Aboriginal people here before white people came and called us that. We were Yorta Yorta. We were Wiradjuri. We were Gamoroi. We were the many hundreds of nations that existed here as we were with our law, our L-O-R-E, our culture, our kinship, our trade, our art, our music, our dance, and all of that was obliterated by a name. And when you name something, you control something. And the language that has been used to describe us, the words that have been used to describe us, 
the policies that have been enacted on us, assimilation, integration, these things that trap us in that logic of race and racism. It, it, I think it is a, a, a very perceptive question because on the one hand, we can deal with the slights of racism. We can deal with the language of, of racism, the racist acts. We can legislate, we can have HR practices, we can, uh, we can make racism and acts of racism socially unacceptable, but it doesn't change the fundamentals of racism. And we still live in a world where people can be defined by race. You know, I think about the Uluru Statement and that extraordinary generosity to open up to Australians and say, there is a journey you can take with us. There is a journey to a better Australia. Um, just the beginnings of a journey, it wouldn't have all of the answers either, just the beginnings of a journey. Um, and yet the people who challenged that, the people who rejected that idea did so on the basis that, well, we can't have separate rules for a different races in Australia. We're not talking about race. We're talking about human beings and justice. I'm not a race apart from my grandmother. We share, we are a human race, but we are a people. We are a proud people and proud people who demand justice. Fixing the structural, institutional assumptions of racism is so much more difficult than just legislating against racist acts, legislating against discrimination. That's the real challenge. And part of it begins with changing the way that we speak, trying to move beyond the toxic logic of race. Even using the language of race immediately traps you within that logic. So as Lisa said, words have power. Think about the words that we use. There was another question came in, Stan, that sort of in a way follows on from that. Um, and I know that you partly answered this in, your, in what you were talking about, but basically they say, is there a quick fix or easy way to resolve inequity for First Nations people and will we ever achieve equality? And that seems to be so related mm. to the, the view. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, Australia is a paradox like so many other countries. Um, there are many things that we do very well in Australia. You know, I've lived in parts of the world that um, Australia looks to them like the envy of the world. I've lived in parts of the world where to step outside each day is no guarantee that you'll come back alive. Um, I've lived in parts of the world where um, there just sim simply is not the opportunity that we can enjoy in Australia, where we can create opportunities that through our people, through our activism and our, our protest and our energy and our dedication have been able to move this country. You know, I think about, I think about people like Charles Perkins and the Freedom Rights. I think about the people like Sir Doug Nichols. I think about people who've marched and protested for the 67 referendum, the tent embassy. I think about the protests of the bicentennial. I think about Eddie Mabo working his way through the courts, rejected and rejected and rejected, did not even live to see the day of his victory and changed Australia. We can do it. And, and it, is, it is part of the paradox of Australia that within it, is the seeds of change, the capacity to change. You know, I, I think sometimes we can be, um, and, and it's understandable um, to be very pessimistic when you look around and you still see that our people um, in every way have the worst socioeconomic outcomes in the country. And yet I look today and I see the incredible success of people graduating today. And I know that everybody graduating is, is making a difference to their own communities. The ripple effects of that success will be felt far and wide. It's, it's an ongoing journey. It's a struggle. There is no quick fix. But we have shown through our actions, we have shown through the strength of our families, through our culture, that we can bend this country, that we can change this country, and we can make it better. So I wouldn't give up hope, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, you know, we should be looking for quick fixes. 
but to know that the to know that people have walked this path before us and to take inspiration from that and to know that as they've changed the country, so are the people who are graduating today going to change this country. It's certainly, certainly all happening, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'll move over to the sort of health area. Many of us have jobs um, where we're asked to do so much and support so many people in our communities. Our jobs have a high turnover and burnout rate, and I have concern about the toll this takes on us all. How can we, as mm. Aboriginal workers, mm. best manage the cultural kind of load? That is really tough. Um, that's, it's not easy, right? It's, it's not easy. Um, and we carry that, we, we, we carry um, an additional weight. Uh, what we do is not just for us, it's for our people and there is a responsibility to our people. Um, you know, I, I lived overseas, I reported overseas for a long time and I could have stayed there, but um, as much as I loved being in the world, my heart was always here and I always came home and I, 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 I knew that this was where I belonged. Um, what sustains me, and I can only speak from my own point of view, is knowing who I am in the world and knowing that there is a place in the world that no one can take from me, that it is my place in the world. It's this country. It's my country. It's my family. It's that shared history. It's, it's the bones of my ancestors in the land. It, it matters, those things. You know, I think about my uncle and, and after working away from Wiradjuri country for many years, how he was able to go home and spend... Um, you know, the last years of his life living on country and what that, mat, what that meant to him to be there, to wake up and feel that beneath your feet. I know it's important for us to go home. I know it's important for us to be able to be surrounded by family. Um, and how hard it's been during COVID for many of us to be separated from that. But it's, it's a load. It's a responsibility. It's not easy. Um, and I think, I think we all accept that don't we um everybody here knows that they're not just they're not just doing this for themselves um and we can never turn our back on who we are and our people and we don't just carry that load i think we carry the load for the country too because this country's future um is in us it's our people have never stopped fighting for a better australia so it's a load we carry for other australians as well I just look at it as our privilege. It's our privilege to be the people who belong to this country. And that helps us carry the load. Thank you. Um, and uh, another question here. What, what do you think that medical students, and I guess we could say other health students as well, um, would most need to know when caring for or interacting with um, First Nations people? It's, it's a lesson that um, I learned when I was very young and I've never forgotten it. And, and it's a lesson that my father um, would always remind me of. And that is that knowledge is not talking. Knowledge is listening. And that's been at the heart of so much of the, the failure of our country is the inability to listen to us the knowledge that was lost because people did not listen to us. I mean, think about, you know, you hear the stories of the explorers, of course, who, you know, went out into the land and never came back, and yet here are our people existing on that same land. I hear those incredible stories of our people actually taking um, the newcomers to, to the most fertile parts of land and sharing it with them. You know, think about the fires of a couple of years ago and how suddenly faced with that devastation, we woke up to the reality that perhaps our people knew something about this and there is something to be learned from this. And of course, when it comes to health, seeing us through someone else's eyes, being told what is good for us has been bad for us. You know, one of the great things that we've seen in my lifetime has been that the strength and the growth of Aboriginal medical services. My parents would rather spend an hour in a car driving to the, near, to the next town where there is an AMS than to spend five minutes in a car going to the local clinic because they walk in there and they listen to 
they're respected. People take the time to care. And so much is listening. And in healthcare, so much is listening. And it's understanding history. You know, one of the first things you do when you go to see a doctor, and if it's the first time at the doc with that doctor, they'll ask you what your medical history is. What illnesses have you had? What illnesses are in the family? Well, we need to ask people and we need to be aware of what the impact history has had on us. History is our health. So listen to people. Listen first. Treat the whole person and treat the history that comes with that person. Because without that, we're going to repeat the problems of the past. It is that is the one single thing I think that I would say to people. Um, listening is knowledge, not talking. Mm. I think that's wisdom, definitely. Mm. Um, and certainly um, many, many non-Indigenous people have lately been expressing their, uh, well, they're puzzled really about hearing the history mm. from an Aboriginal perspective that they had no real idea of because it wasn't taught in school. But, it, but, but it, isn't it incredible that, you know, I often hear that and people say, but it wasn't taught in schools. And I thought, but I think, but, but this was happening before your eyes. Which country were you living in? This was happening in your towns, in your cities. Um, you didn't need to be taught in schools because this was happening in your families. And why were you not talking to our people who carried that history? I mean, it's, um, you know, schools, schools um, uh, uh, you know, can, can teach history, but we live history. That's the difference. Yeah, listening would certainly mm. go a long way. One of the... Uh, topical things at the moment is climate change. Um, and we've got a couple of questions here that link. Um, Tony says, Stan, you mentioned fragility of the planet, which is closely related to health and wellbeing. Where, where are the strong Indigenous voices at present as the Australian government is about to belatedly announce a plan on addressing climate change to take to Glasgow? Well, again, unfortunately, um, we don't hear our voices in this conversation. You know, I've heard more in the last couple of weeks about the National Party and the farmers' voices. Um, and that, that's important, you know, the farmers' voices is important. But where are our voices? And, and it's, not just, it's not just climate change. It's across the whole spectrum of government policy. Where are our voices when it comes to defence policy? superannuation policy, taxation policy, all of these things affect us as well. It was one of the things that I thought one of the, 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 the potential of what is known as a voice in the constitution, some sort of representative body that may emerge out of the Uluru process, um, is that you would have a body that would not just be able to speak on issues that are deemed to be indigenous issues, but to speak with an Indigenous voice across all issues, yeah. because these things affect us. But it's a great question because, you know, I'd, I'd ask anyone here, when do you hear this voice? You know, I know that the programs that I do, um, you often, you know, I often have to go out of my way to insist that we get an Indigenous voice, not because there is just one Indigenous perspective, there isn't, um, but because, Indigenous voices need to be part of a broader conversation. In all of our diversity, in all of our difference, um, we need to be part of that, of that, of that conversation. And again, um, we're, what we're dealing with here, with the impact of climate change and man-made climate change on our planet, is the impact of what we've known as 200 years of modernity, is the impact of colonisation and empire and industrialisation. Um, land being stolen, the, the waterways poisoned, um, the trees chopped down. I mean, we've, we've created a remarkable world. We live longer than we've ever lived in human history. We are richer than we've ever been. We can send people to the moon. Um, we carry more intellectual power in a phone than it took to send 
um, the Apollo mission to the moon in the 60s. Um, it, it, it's, we live in a remarkable age, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not one to decry that. You know, Western knowledge has been remarkable. Western philosophy and ideas are remarkable, but so are ours. Yeah. And that ability to share knowledge, I think someone pointed out earlier on, may have been Lisa, um, some of the, the students coming in who are pairing Western knowledge systems with traditional knowledge systems. Um, and it's that sharing of knowledge that leads to better outcomes. Yeah. The West doesn't have all the answers. And I think we're rapidly finding that out. That's so true. Um, now, there's heaps more questions, and I know Stephen I can take another one. Yeah, would that's... love to answer them, but we're competing with morning. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to take you away from your tea. So I think we'd better um, have our break and right. um, stock up ready for the next sessions. So thank you so oh, much, Stan. We really thank you, appreciated Rena. your insight and wisdom. Oh, look, it's 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 been a real pleasure, and it's um, I, I really needed this today. Um, you know, we, with our family going through what we go through, and we know that our, our people sadly um, deal with this loss all the time. And yeah. um, you know, going through this, I, I, I needed to be among yeah. among you. So thank thank you all for having me. Thanks so much, Dan. Thank you.